Good morning, my beautiful babes and babettes. I'm your resident active advocate, and today I would like to talk to you mostly about disability in Disney's portrayal in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. However, there are racial elements to this movie to discuss as well. I will touch on those, but the main point of this video will be the disability angle. So kind of getting back to OG Active Advocate here, because I've been on the racism angle for quite a few videos now. Um, like I say, though, I'm not a one-issue advocate, so I just want to expand my horizons as applicable. In this movie, you see among the most vicious, evil versions of Claude Frollo that you see in any version of this story. The book itself is very old, um, written by, what's his name, uh, Victor Hugo. And it was written by Hugo basically as a shout out to the Notre Dame Cathedral itself. Hugo saw literature as a passing, as a passing form of media, whereas architecture was, in his mind, a much more permanent and poignant form of media, shall we say. Um, in this context, he's using the word media to apply to anything that we interact with that gives us a sense of what is around us in the world. So literature is definitely one of those things, but architecture, in his mind, was a much more enduring form because the building itself has been there since I believe it was the 1300s in France, and that would have been earlier than the time of the French Renaissance. The Renaissance actually came fairly late to France as compared to places like, say, Italy, where the Renaissance began. Um, the whole point of this movie, though, is not to honor the cathedral necessarily and to put the cathedral in, like, front stage. Rather, the point of the story is to outline why ableism and racism are two bad things. And kudos to Disney for going about it this way. But the portrayal, as I say, of... Um, Claude Frollo. In the book, he's a priest. In this movie, he's a judge, okay? So, um, his roles have been changed. But he is among Disney's most evil, hated villains. And I want to focus for this video primarily on his psychological profile. However, I will also be talking about Quasimodo and the implications of physical disability that follow him around throughout the entirety of the movie. So, all right, I'm going actually to start with the smaller things and get into the larger things in this analysis. So, I want to talk about the racial elements present in this movie. There is a great distinction made between us and them, in Frollo's mind at least, because he is a white Parisian man who is a devotee of the church, who upholds the law, and who sees himself as morally superior to the gypsies who are all over Paris and whom he disdains, not only because they have darker skin, which they do, but also because he sees them as irreligious due to their practice of trickery. For the gypsies, it is not actually witchcraft, okay? It's just a bag of tricks. You know how, quote, magic works. It's all just sleight of hand, things done very quickly to distract you while the real act is going on behind the curtain, that sort of thing. And Frollo, in his ignorance, sees the sleight of hand as witchcraft. Historically speaking, the Catholic Church was responsible for a great deal of witch burnings and for the witch hunts. Not exclusively responsible, though, because much later in history, the Salem witch trials, they were not executed by Catholics. Those were executed by Puritanicals, um, which are a much more conservative branch of Christianity than Catholicism even. Catholicism, however, has had its share of 
um, abuse of the other when it came to especially women and especially non-white women being put on trial, very unfair trial much of the time, and charged for the use of witchcraft. In the Bible, it is stated that those who use magic are opposed to God. You know, they are not looked upon kindly by God. And in many conservative branches of Christianity, as well in as well as in other religions such as Islam, and I'm not trying to shout out anyone negatively here, the practice of magic is seen as forbidden, even though there's nothing supernatural about it, and we know that now. But back in the day when these rules were created, people weren't aware of that. They weren't aware of what was going on behind the proverbial curtain. When Frollo encounters gypsies in this movie, therefore, he persecutes them heavily and to the point of locking them in prison for the rest of their lives, to the point of murdering them and even their children. As you see at the beginning of the movie, when he comes across two gypsies who are fleeing into Paris and trying to seek refuge somewhere because of Frollo's literal witch hunt going on around the city and within the city. So Quasimodo's parents, are attempting to find shelter somewhere in the city. They are captured by Frollo, and Frollo assumes that Quasimodo's mother, because she is carrying a bum, uh, bundle, which is Quasimodo, um, that she is holding stolen goods. So he pursues her and ends up accidentally killing her on the very steps of the Notre Dame Cathedral. He finds that the bundle he had been trying to take from the mother is in fact a baby, but upon opening the blanket, he sees that Quasimoto, and by the way, his name means half-formed, okay? That's Latin for half-formed. He sees that Quasimoto is, quote, disfigured, right? He is a hunchback. Back in the day, before the introduction of practical medical science, Many more children were born with neural tube defects than, than occurs now. So neural tube defects, and I have described these earlier in my long-running series now, but they include such things as spina, spina bifida, hydrocephalus, and scoliosis. It is likely that Quasimodo would have had either scoliosis or spina bifida, but to a far greater extent than what would be considered you know, acceptable by the social schema of his time, especially. Um, being a hunchback, Quasimodo was deemed by Frollo to be a monster sent from hell. He attempts to drown the child, but the archdeacon of the cathedral stops him and says, you've already killed this boy's mother. You know, you have no right to take another life. Frollo says to him, I'm sending this demon back to hell where it belongs. But the archdeacon says, no, no, I will not allow you to do another form of violence out right outside of my cathedral. You are to take this child in and raise him as your own. And Frollo says, all right, for the sake of my immortal soul, I will take this child in and who knows, he might even be useful one day. So in the book, Quasimodo is deaf because Frollo makes him into the bell ringer of Notre Dame. And way back in the day, you really would get human beings up in the bell towers ringing the bells of churches. They would be extraordinarily loud, and they didn't understand about hearing protection back then. So in the book, he is deaf. In the movie, he is not. And I don't think that does a disservice to his character exactly because he is already looked down upon by Frollo, and it is assumed that he would be looked down upon by society were he ever permitted to venture outside of the bell tower. Frollo has Quasimodo very much within his control. Frollo imposes Stockholm Syndrome on Quasimodo. Quasimodo believes that the world itself, through Frollo's eyes, through Frollo, uh, Frollo's interpretation, Quasimodo believes that the world is full of evil, wicked people who would only harm him were he to venture outside of the bell tower. The problem is Frollo's psychological profile does not allow him to see that there is goodness in the world. 
Frollo suffers not only from egocentrism, but also, I would argue, from a form of trauma brought on by brought on by religion, quite frankly, because Frollo sees God as this horrible, vengeful figure who will come down from the heavens and punish any who go against, quote, his will, all right? This occurs in Frollo probably before the start of the movie, but at the start of the movie when he accidentally kills. It was accidental. Um, Quasimodo's mother, and then almost purposefully kills Quasimodo himself. Frollo is looking around at the statues of the saints and the guardians of the church, and, you know, he sees nothing in those faces but judges and executioners. In my interpretation of Frollo's character, he is suffering from trauma brought on by religion because he sees no love in God. He sees God only as a figure of punishment and of judgment. And that, unfortunately, is what Frollo himself is to the people. So Frollo sees himself reflected in his version of God, but Frollo does not recognize his own hypocrisy. So he puts that hypocrisy, that cruelty, that evil, that punishment and judgment upon God. Because this is a quote from Fight Club, but um, if you're a white Christian male, your father is your model for God. At this point, though, I would say that Frollo's own psyche is his model for God. But he's too wrapped up in his own egotism and self-centric narrative that he does not realize that he is the one who is the hypocrite, who is the judge, who is the one who will cast people down into suffering and misery in order to elevate his own standing. He does this to everyone he influences, the gypsies especially, but to Quasimodo in particular. The racial narrative, and I want to get back to this, comes into play in two aspects of this story. Firstly, I want to talk about the fact that Quasimodo had dark-skinned parents. They would have been full-blooded gypsies. And um, originally it was believed that the gypsies came from Egypt, which is how they got their name, and is also how, what, the reason why they were portrayed as being darker-skinned. Um, Quasimodo has dark-skinned parents. They both are. Quasimodo is white and has auburn hair. Explain this one to me. But it's basically another racial analog of the one with white skin is, you know, good amongst this otherwise, quote, bad group. Um, but on the other hand, you see Esmeralda, who is a dark-skinned gypsy, and she is pretty much Quasimodo's rock. Throughout the entirety of this movie, she saves him from being tormented. She comes to see him in the bell tower when he's lonely and confined there by Frollo. Frollo falls madly in love with her, or madly in lust with her. Okay, I, I don't want to use the language of love because this is not love. Frollo falls madly in lust with Esmeralda, but because he sees God as the judge and executioner, he is tormented within his own soul, thinking, how can I be in love with this gypsy witch? You know, in his song, Hellfire, which is very famous, he outlines the whole mental struggle that he's going through. Um, you know, it's not my fault. I'm not to blame. It is the gypsy girl, the witch who set this flame. It's not my fault if in God's plan, he made the devil so much stronger than a man. Frollo views Esmeralda in particular, but the gypsies in general, as the other, therefore as the devil. As I have explained earlier in this series, the other is also analogous to the evil. If it's not like us, if it doesn't walk and talk and quack like a duck, like we do, then if it's other, it's evil. And that is the very rigid dichotomy under which Frollo forms his entire world. So when he finds out that Quasimodo also has feelings for Esmeralda, then he 
puts Quasimodo under, not house arrest, but tower arrest, quite frankly, and goes on the biggest witch hunt of his life to find and flush out all of the gypsies in Paris, put them all on trial, and potentially put them all to death. All in the name of, though he will not admit it even to himself, all in the name of capturing Esmeralda and forcing her into a relationship with him. You have to bear in mind the time period here, okay? But this is a particularly evil version of Frollo. He's a very old man. Esmeralda is probably a teenager at this point. At the end of the movie, though, he says to her, as he has her tied to a stake and is about to burn her to death for the crime of witchcraft, he says to her, I give you one last choice to save your soul from the flames. Choose me or the fire. She spits in his face, and I don't blame him. Er, I don't blame her because he's been tormenting her people for decades at this point. And, you know, she would literally rather burn to death than be with this man. Due to the portrayal present of Frollo in this movie, again, I do not blame her, but Frollo himself, it must be understood, is suffering. Due to his view of God, as I say, he is suffering from a form of religious trauma that can only be undone by knowing real love. The problem is Frollo is so wrapped up in himself that he refuses love, that he refuses to see the good in the world. The only thing he sees around him, even in the figures of saints, are the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And he sees that in Mother Mary, he sees that in Jesus, he sees that in God, he sees that in the gypsies, who are tricky but good for the most part. You know, when they find out that Quasimodo has found their hideout, they're about to kill him before Esmeralda comes in and says, no, you know, he's not a spy, he's our friend. So it is due to Esmeralda's influence, though, that Quasimodo is permitted to come out of hiding, both in the physical and emotional sense. Before that, he had been Frollo's prisoner, not only in body, but in soul, in mind, as I say, he had succumbed long ago to Stockholm Syndrome and saw Frollo as the only protector he had. By the end of the movie, though, and I have neglected to mention this character for a good reason up to this point, um, Phoebus? Okay? Tall, blonde, manly, um, able-bodied, okay? That's the main point of this. Phoebus was the captain of Frollo's guard and was responsible for a great many of the witch hunts that happened. But Phoebus, too, falls in love, and I will say love, with Esmeralda. You, you have a bit of a love square going on here. You have Esmeralda, you have Frollo, who is in lust with her. You have Quasimodo, who is in love with her because she is the only person who has ever treated him with kindness. And you have Phoebus, who is in love with her because he sees her beauty, first of all, but he also sees her kindness, her bravery, the fact that she is willing to stand up for the oppressed. And you definitely see this as a prominent character trait of hers during her song, God Help the Outcasts. I listen to that song and it still makes me cry <laughs> sometimes. It's a very moving number, and especially since she has the ambiance of the entire cathedral, and it's a beautiful portrayal of the cathedral in this movie. You know, she is surrounded by this heavenly light, by figures of the saints whom she sees as guardians rather than as her judges and juries and executioners. You know, it can be argued that Esmeralda, unlike Frollo, because she does not cling to the image of God as judge, jury, and executioner, as I keep saying, she has what you may judge as the true religion in her soul. You know, she could be considered a true Christian, in the context of this movie. I'm not trying to make a no true Scotsman fallacy here. Um, no true Scotsman fallacy is one that says 
a real Catholic will act like this. A real Muslim will act like this. A real anything, really any category that you can make, will act like this. That, however, I think is a way of stereotyping people and of making them all the same. So I don't want to succumb to the no truth Gothman fallacy here, but in the context of the movie, Esmeralda is portrayed as being closer to God and especially to Mother Mary, who is the guardian of the cathedral. Notre Dame means Our Lady, right? That's French. But um, Esmeralda is portrayed as being closer to the movie's idea of the true religion and to arguably my idea of the true religion as well. Whereas Frollo, because of his religious zealotry, sees God as this figure of punishment and judgment and evil and acts upon that image in his own life. So by the end of the movie, um, Frollo is dead and falls to his death from the roof of Notre Dame or quite high up on the building. If you've ever seen the building, um, you know, you know, it's a very high, lofty, grand building. This was built in the Gothic architecture style because Gothic architecture is meant, especially in the form of cathedral, to draw your eye upward. God in the Abrahamic religion this is always portrayed as being up, above, you know, transcendent of the earth and a being of the sky. He, he quotation marks, is the traditional sky father in Abrahamic religions. And that's a theme long since held over from, from paganism. But to address the end of the movie, Phoebus betrayed Frollo and decided to side with the gypsies and with Quasimodo, who are objectively better people than Frollo in this movie. Phoebus almost loses his life. Esmeralda saves him. He falls for Esmeralda right in front of Quasimodo. You know, Esmeralda and Phoebus are having a romantic moment, and Quasimodo is just absolutely shattered. He is absolutely shattered. Esmeralda is the only person to have ever shown him in his life kindness. And by the end of the movie, she ends up with Phoebus, not with Quasimodo, even though I would argue that she and Quasimodo not only have a closer relationship, but a better relationship. I understand that the interpretation here is that they are just meant to be friends because, you know, throughout the movie, he keeps saying, who could ever love a monster such as me? The takeaway of the movie is... Who is the monster and who is the man? Frollo, you are supposed to see as the monster. Quasimodo, you are supposed to see as the man. Despite the fact that Frollo is able-bodied and, you know, all that, Quasimodo is visibly and quite badly, shall we say, disabled. Um, but even by the end of the movie, Quasimodo doesn't get the girl. And in the Disney paradigm specifically, that is supposed to be the end goal, supposed to be an end goal, both in quotations, of any story. Quasimodo's reward is that he is accepted by the people and he is allowed to live a free and open life outside of the cathedral. You know, he can go where he wants now. He can live among the people. At the very beginning of the movie, he sings his I Want song. That is a theme in musicals, by the way, of where the hero or protagonist sings about what they want, quite frankly, hence the name the I Want song. Um, his I Want song is called Out There, and in it he expresses his wish to be amongst the people, to be like them, to do as they do, to live as they live. By the end of the movie, yes, he does have that, but in the Disney conceit, specifically, he doesn't have the girl. Pardon me, pop-ups, I'm sorry. And that is a subversion of the happy ending in Disney, both for better and for worse, because this movie was made in the 90s, and was... You could argue that this movie was the end of the Renaissance. Um, 
in the Disney Renaissance, you see so many movies where they got the girl is the end point. In this movie, you don't. I would say that that looks really good for the overall narrative of the movie in that Quasimodo just wants to be with the people, to be accepted by them, to be loved as a human being. However, on the disability-related side of the narrative, this is bad because it basically shows because you are ugly, you can never have this specific kind of love. You can never have the romantic love, the romantic attachment. So Quasimodo not only has a spina bifida or scoliosis, but he is also very physically unattractive. And that is a running theme throughout the movie too. People are actually frightened by his appearance until the very end where he proves his pure heartedness and his heroism by helping the people to save Paris. And he specifically is the one to save Esmeralda. Warning you now, the book does not end that way. As far as I know, I have not read the book, but you know pretty early on that that is not how the book ends. I don't know whether the book is specifically a tragedy, but it is portrayed as having a rather somber ending, unlike the Disney movie, where you do get the happily ever after of the hero literally being carried away on the people's shoulders. But in the Disney conceit, is that enough? And from the disability angle of this story, is that enough? Is it enough for Quasimodo just to be accepted by the people? Or would it look better on the disability narrative for him to also get the girl with whom he has had the strongest relationship in this movie? Strongest and closest. You know, she and Phoebus might be physically attracted to one another. He might be attracted to her bravery. Same with her for him by the end of the movie, by the way, because he really sticks his neck out for a lot of the people she cares about, including Quasimodo. But it's ambiguous. I'm going to end this by saying that this is ambiguous. Watch the movie for yourself. I warn you now, this movie is not for children, okay? If you're under, I don't know, 12, I wouldn't really recommend it um, because of certain things that happen, especially during the Hellfire sequence, which, as I say, is very famous. But watch it with discerning eyes and know that Frollo, especially, is emotionally sick, okay? And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean, like, literally, he is ill. Religious trauma brought on by the environment around him and brought on by his own actions. This whole theme of being saved versus damned, and it's entirely dependent on, in Frollo's eyes, on God's whim. In Quasimodo's eyes, and the eyes of the, quote, true believers in this movie, it is based on your own beliefs and actions and thoughts. And I like that takeaway, actually. I do like the pseudo-religious angle of this movie here. Not even pseudo, this is just a religious angle, quite frankly. Um, even if you're not Catholic, you will probably get it, at least. Um, so I definitely recommend this movie. Just don't go into it if you are faint of heart, because it's not a nice movie, capital N, shall we say, but it is a good movie. So, and especially the music, oh my goodness. Um, you get the Gregorian choirs and it, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. As well as the architecture of Notre Dame, as I say, and the ambiance inside that church. Mm, spot on, picture perfect. All right, so that's my video for today. I will be taking tomorrow off because tomorrow is Good Friday on the Lenten calendar. So it is a holiday for everybody, I think. Um, but yeah, tomorrow will be a holiday. <clears throat> I will resume on Monday because I also take weekends off with another movie. Not sure which one yet. I will look into this and get back to y'all lovely people. Hope you have enjoyed. Thank you for sticking with me for this long. This is a long one. And I will see y'all on Monday. Mwah.